If you were the CEO of a major U.S. airline, what would keep you up at night? What would keep you awake at night? Just a, just a quick raise of hands. The bottom line? The fear of crash? Anything else? Fuel prices maybe? If I were the one, I, that was what would be worry me the most, is staying up at night thinking that this may happen to me. The reality though of the CEO of Southwest Airlines, Herb Kelleher, was this. Herb Kelleher said, what keeps me awake at night are the intangibles. It's the intangibles that are the hardest thing for a competitor to imitate. So my biggest fear is that we lose the culture, the spirit. If we ever do lose that, we will have lost our most important competitive asset. And this is what Herb Kelleher, he's no longer the CEO, but was for, for almost 30 years, would dream about and think about all the time. Now Southwest Airlines, why should we listen to them? There's a few reasons why we should listen to them. One of them is that Southwest Airlines compared to every other airline and every other major airline has been much more successful in three different arenas. First of all, financially. Last year they saw 39 consecutive years of profitability. During those 39 years, there were 49 other airlines that went bankrupt. So not only lost money, but they went bankrupt. American Airlines, bankrupt. Delta, bankrupt. U.S. Airways, bankrupt. Northwest Airlines, bankrupt. United, bankrupt. 49. Everybody else lost money during that time. How on earth, in one of the worst industries in the world to do business, did Southwest Airlines have a profit for 39 consecutive years? It wasn't only the financial aspect that makes us want to listen to what Southwest has to say, but it was also how they treated their employees. Because in 2010, they were ranked, out of all companies in the United States, the number one place to work by their employees. They were ranked the number one company to be to employ you. So not only was their financial performance, but they had engaged employees. And lastly, the American Customer Satisfaction Index has ranked Southwest Airlines since from 1994, when they first started doing rankings, to now, 18 years, number one for customer satisfaction. So financially, employee engagement and customer satisfaction. So it's important to listen to what Southwest has to say. And Herb Kelleher didn't stay awake at night thinking about safety. He didn't think, stay, away, stay awake at night thinking about fuel prices. He stayed awake at night thinking about culture, which is my presentation is going to be talking about why it's the most important thing that you can do as a leader or as an employee of your organization is to get everyone focused on culture because that will determine your success in those three areas. So I want to show a quick video of Southwest Airlines that's going to tell a better story of them than I can. Um, it's of Ken Blanchard, and for those of you that don't know Ken Blanchard, he wrote Who Moved My Cheese, which is a change management book, and he also wrote a number of other books, including The One Minute Manager. Um, and he recently wrote a book called How to Lead with Love. And love is L-U-V, which is the ticker for Southwest Airlines on the New York Stock Exchange. So this is, this is the video. Hi, I'm Ken Blanchard. I want to tell you about my new book, Lead with Love, a different way to create real success. I wrote the book with Colleen Barrett, President Emeritus of Southwest Airlines. Love is spelled L-U-V because that's Southwest symbol on the New York Stock Exchange. If you know anything about Southwest, you know they're all about love. They love their people. They love their customers. They love their work, and they take it seriously, but they don't take themselves seriously. For example, a colleague of mine was flying on Southwest recently when the attendant got on the public address system and said, you know, this is the last flight of the day, and we're really tired. To be honest with you, we don't have the energy to pass out the peanuts and the potato chips, so we're gonna put them on the floor in the front of the plane, and when we take off and gain altitude, they'll slide down the aisle. If you want some peanuts or chips, just grab them. And that's what happened. The whole plane was in hysterics, laughing, having fun, grabbing peanuts, passing them to their neighbors, and just having a blast. That's leading with love. How different is that 
than your typical experience on most airlines where everyone seems to be uptight. Leading with love is about treating your customers right. Southwest really gets this. For example, when you call most airlines to change your reservation, you usually get a recording that says they really value your business, but all of their operators are busy right now. They'll get back to you as soon as possible. Then the music starts. You could be waiting on hold for 15 or 20 minutes or more. But when you call Southwest Airlines, you usually get a real live person. And if you don't, you get a recording that says, your business is really important to us. I'm sorry all of our operators are busy right now, but at the beep, please leave your name and phone number and we'll get back to you in 10 minutes. I did this recently, and you know what happened in 10 minutes? My phone rang and somebody said, is this Ken Blanchard? Yes, it is, I said. This is Bob from Southwest Airlines, he said. How can I help you? Now that's what I call raving fan service. And that's how you lead with love. No wonder Southwest is the only airline that has consistently turned a profit while the others have struggled. These heartwarming stories don't happen by accident. When an organization has happy people, happy customers, and happy shareholders, it's because the leadership has created a culture that supports leading with love. Um, so I have three goals for today. First of all is to share, and it's to share four different case studies of what I will say great organizations who have great cultures so that you can get excited about the idea of focusing on culture. And that's going to be Southwest, which we just listened to. It's going to be Davida, which is a dialysis company, Zappos, an online company, and lastly, uh, Kalo. Uh, which is uh, Nicole and my, my company. That's going to be the first goal. The second goal is going to be to persuade. It's going to persuade you to be obsessive about culture. Understand that culture is going to make all the difference. And it's going to be the, the most important investment that you can make for your employees to be more engaged, for your customers, your families to be satisfied. And at the end of the day, it's going to be about treatment improvement and quality improvement. Lastly, a third thing is going to be to empower you. So once you're bought into this and understanding how powerful and important culture is and how you have to be obsessive and intentional about it, I want to be able to give you the tools. So I want it to be a very practical presentation where you can take a lot of notes and then go back and speak to your leaders or if you're the leader of your organization and make some changes. Um, first of all, I'll take a step back. Drew uh, it was nice enough to introduce myself. Alex Stavros, the president and CEO of Kalo. Um, uh, my background's in business. Uh, I went to Stanford University where I got a master's in business administration. Prior to that, all of my experience has really been in mostly the for-profit industry and business industry, but industries that were inherently mission-driven. Cambridge Associates, where I spent most of my career, uh, is a consulting firm, one of the biggest in the world, for endowments and foundations. Then a little bit about Kalo. Also, Drew was able to sh share about Kalo. Is, uh, Kalo is a specialized residential treatment center for adolescents, and we're nationally recognized for attachment disorder and devel devel developmental trauma uh, disorder treatment. Uh, there's a couple things that are interesting about Kalo. One of them, as, as Drew mentioned, are canines. We have 50 students, and we have 125 employees, uh, which makes a 2.5 to 1 ratio, which is an extremely high ratio, and the reason is because it's a relational program. But we also not only have 125 employees, but I would say that we want to add onto that another 35 employees, which are 35 golden retrievers. We have 35 golden retrievers running around campus, sleeping in the rooms with the kids, going to class with the kids. It's been one of the most powerful, um, one of the most powerful interventions, therapeutic interventions that, that we've been able to have, especially with kids with attachment disorder. The next part is, is the relational aspect. At Kalo, it is extremely important for us to as Steve was talking about in the morning, to move away from the consequences, move away from the punishments and the rewards for these, for these kids who see it more as an abuse system. Um, they need to understand that, we need to understand that they come from a, a life and environment of broken relationships. Therefore, their life and their hearts need to be healed within the context of relationships. And what they need to experience is, is what, um, Somebody's, is any, maybe some people are having some sensory overload over here. Can we turn that off? I'm going to plug it. Um, 
and and so so it's an important why I'm, why I'm talking about this because Kalo is going to be one of our case studies, and so I want you to know a little bit about a little bit about the background of of Kalo. Uh, so let's go. Let's start with some quick definitions for culture. Anybody want to offer one? Culture, other than what you find in yogurt. Shared beliefs. Go ahead, Ed. Yep. So this concept of grow uh, a group, concept of something that needs to be shared. Here's a definition um, from an anthropology definition that we, I want to show you real quick. Specifically, the term culture in American anthropology had two meanings. One is the evolved human capacity to classify and represent experiences with symbols and to act creatively. And number two, the distinct ways that people living in different parts of the world classified and represented their experiences. So the classify and represent experiences with symbols. They go on to say distinction is current between the physical artifacts and then the tangibles, then tangibles such as language, customs, etc. Then tangible. So we're going back to, sorry about that. Let me, let me shut that off. Going back to what Herb Kelleher talked about in terms of the intangibles. So in anthropology, they have the same definition. From, a, from an organizational standpoint, it's a blend of the values, beliefs, taboos, symbols, rituals, and myths all companies develop over time. There's a key word in this, and that's all. So you like it or not, you're intentional about it or not, your organization has a culture. And so do you want it to be by default, just who shows up and who has the loudest voice? Or do you want to be intentional? Because all organizations have one. I like to think about it from uh, the perspective of guardrails. When you're on this windy road and you want to avoid falling off the road late at night, you have guardrails that help show you which way to go. So when you think about where you are today and then you have a vision for where you want to go in the future, you have strategies that give you the tactics to get there. What strategically do we need to do in tactics to get to this vision, vision and reach it? But then there's a question of how am I going to behave? How am I going to interact with others along the way? And that's where culture comes into play. And that's where the guardrails either approve or disapprove of certain things, of how you treat other people, how you treat your coworkers, how you treat your families and your patients and your customers. Um, another way to think about it is just peer pressure. It's a social construction of reality. It's a group of people create culture, and whoever's there, that's what's going to exist. So here you can see somebody, this guy come out of the bathroom, and he didn't wash his hands. He didn't know that, but there's a big alarm that's saying you don't wash your hands. So trust me, next time he's going to wash his hands. So that peer pressure is an important part. Um, so much of what we accept as true or important in organizations comes only from a consensus of others. To know what is important, we often rely upon information. Information is key. And there's a couple things. One is from our own past behavior. Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Our peers and other group members, and lastly, clear signals from those that you look up to, you respect, or want to respect. It's important that you realize that it's not just the peers around you, but it's what you bring into the table. Why we're going to talk a little bit later about why hiring is so important. Because culture and values is not something you can install in someone. You're either predisposed to them or not. So again, three goals today, for today. The first one is to share a couple case, study, case studies. I talked about Southwest. Now I want to talk about Davida. Davida means in Latin, he or she gives life. Di uh, Davida is a dialysis center. For those that don't know, they work with um, patients who have kidney failure, who aren't able to urinate. The reason you want to urinate is you want to get rid of the toxins. So if you can't get rid of the toxins, you'll die. And so they go to the dialysis center to, to remove those toxins. So there are thousands of centers across the country, which is important to know about this business because a lot of these patients are on their last leg and a lot of them end up dying. Some of them even die in the centers themselves. It's a very tough job. It's also a job that the people that work there are much like our frontline staff in the sense that they get paid between 10 to $15 an hour. And it's also and, and, and they have really tough jobs that are emotional draining. And then the other interesting thing is because you have thousands of centers around the country, how on earth do you create a culture if nobody's together? And Davida figured that out. So let me tell you real quick about Davida. In 1999, they were called Total Renal Care. Is that an inspiring name? Not so much. So Davida, he or she gives life. Changes your perception as an employee. Why are you here? I'm here to give life. So if your job is tough, you now see it as your job 
is, is visionary and you are saving lives. They were focused on growth just through acquisitions, just buying more companies. And, and because of this, the, and they're too focused on financials, not focused on culture like Herb Kelleher was. Shares went down from $50 to $2. Um, high turnover. They were investigated by the CE, SC, SEC during this time for fraud. They were being sued by their shareholders. And they were seven weeks from, away from missing payroll. In comes Kent Theory. And Kent Theory, like Herb Kelleher, said one thing, culture. And that's what's going to change this company. It was, in, it was in financial distress. People hated working there. It was just terrible. It was depressing. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. And from that day on, you have the S&P 500 down here, and you have every single other player in the industry, and you can see how different the financial performance was. Not only that, but the clinical outcomes went through, this, went through the roof. They're higher than any other uh, player in the industry ever. Again, he came in and said, I'm not going to focus on clinical quality. I'm not going to focus on the financials. I'm going to focus on culture. So this is where they were in 2007. The brink of bankrupt, they went from $1 billion to $5 billion. They went from 14,000 employees to 30,000. They reduced turnover by half. They have the highest growth rate in the industry that's ever happened. And it hasn't been through acquisition, internal growth. And the best in the industry in terms of clinical outcomes. So what happened? Here's a quick, another, uh, quick video, three minutes again. is We're going to see Kent Theory, who's presenting at UCLA School of Business, to some of the students there. And then he's going to show a video of they have these onboarding type training events for all their employees that fly in from all the different centers and, and then they watch this presentation and they have various trainings. And so it's going to give you a little bit of perspective on how obsessive they are about culture and how important it is.
hear me for a moment, because the way we start meetings at the Vita is with a Yoda Vita, and it's just for Pia Yoda Vita! Yoda Vita! One more time, Yoda Vita! So, um, you know, the word cult, in the word culture, there's also the word cult. That was kind of wacky, huh? It seemed like some mega church and, and wacky. I was like, everybody's kind of. Well, so is that weird or is that the way to get the best clinical outcomes? That passion that people had for the jobs they do is unbelievable, in my opinion. So, what, what, are, what are some of the things that jumped out at you guys? Other than it being kind of wacky. Great, yeah. Just part of the crowd. You're going to see that what they, when they talk about DaVita, they say community first, company second. So he's part of the community. They call it a village, too, and that he's the mayor of the village. He's not the CEO of the company. He's the mayor of the village. He's part of the village. Anything else people thought was kind of wacky, interesting? The energy level of the employees. Impressive. He defies convention. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Great words. Language is so important. They all were kind of in tune with what was going on. And where did they find this language? And they, they all would say it back. Kind of like a sports team. Well, they're very united, too. I mean, they're very much. Yep. Yep. Tune. Yep. So one thing that I'm going to talk about is when, they, when he took over DaVita, he, brought, he took, got rid of all the leadership, got rid of tons of people, brought in new leadership, and right off the bat they said, when we sit around our leadership t table, and each time, each time you refer to our employees in any other way other than teammates, you need to put a hundred dollar bill in the middle of this, uh, of this table every day. Thousands and thousands of dollars. But within two months, the whole company, thousands of employees, nobody would refer to themselves with, uh, with, with any other term other than teammates. So the team, team aspect is, is extremely important. So here are a couple things. One of them is the theme song taking care of patients every day. And so they sing that all the time. They know that. And you can imagine them singing that every morning at their center where they only have like 8, 10, 12 employees. Another thing was new ours where he says, what is our company? Everybody says, new. Who's, whose is it? Ours. And what are we going to make it? Special. So there's a lot of ownership in that. Our company's new and it's always going to be new. And it's ours. So we own it and we can make it special. He also talked about no brag. Just facts. No brag, just facts. It has to do with a lot of the importance of evidence-based management, that they wanted facts to make decisions. Just don't talk a big game of what we should be doing. And the three musketeers concept, that's how they're addressed. They do that all the time. And this isn't a Halloween party or anything. This is training. This is what you, all employees, every employee has to fly here and experience this. It's a three-day event of training. And they go and they experience this. And so they're addressed, so they one for all, all for one, again, again the teammate. That it's about, it's about all three of them, the three musketeers. And the community aspect that I talked about before and the importance of, of, of teammates. So how do they do this? Because they came up with a vision that was compelling. They come up with a mission. And they come up with some important values. We'll go, we'll go into this a little bit deeper, not with, not with regards to DaVita. One interesting thing about DaVita is the star. They talk about the star. Remember we talked about symbols. The star they would put... When you walk into any DeVito, you're going to see a big star there. And the reason why is because they have this story that this star lives in this lush green valley. And the star only comes out to sit on top of the eye when there's a teammate who does something special that's aligned with their values and their culture. And so what they talk about is, but you're always going to see the star on top of the eye because there's always somewhere doing something special and representing our culture. So you walk in and you see the star, you know what it means right away. The symbols reinforce how you behave. So now I'm going to talk about Zappos real quick. Um, Tony Shea uh, came in as CEO. He hates shoes. They're, just, they're dumb. He's not interested. They sell shoes. That's their business. He doesn't see it that way. He says, we're a customer service company that happens to sell shoes. I don't care about the shoes. It's nothing to do with anything. So we're going to watch a quick, quick video, and this is going to be the last, uh, the last one, but this one's th another wacky company. Sales associates, dressed as barmaids. How's everyone doing? Are you being safe? Spider Man in the cafeteria. Oh. Racing toy cars in the middle of the office. What's going on here? Welcome to the zoo. Wow. 
What you are witnessing is a social experiment by Tony Shea, the entrepreneur and mastermind behind Zappos, the online shoe company. His revolutionary way of running a business has made Zappos into a $1.2 billion powerhouse. And he got there with the guiding principle, great things will happen if <laughs> you make employees happy. It's like a playground. I mean, there are balloons, there are whistles. Is that our business? We think it's important for employees to have fun. And that drives employee engagement that comes with strong cultures and to outperform the ones that don't have strong cultures. Shea's hugely successful company sells over a thousand brands of shoes in just about every style, size, and color. Ship 24 hours a day, as many as you like, and it's free shipping both ways. At Zappos headquarters in Henderson, Nevada, outside of Las Vegas, no dollar corporate cubicles here. Instead, employees are cheerful and downright zany. And no CEO corner office. Instead, Tony Shea sits in the middle, in his own cubicle, next to his assistant. You want your people you hire to be, in your words, a little weird. Why does that mean? One of our core values is to create fun and a little weirdness. We really recognize and celebrate each person's individuality. We want their true personality to shine in the workplace. So I definitely do not want to repeat the same mistake I made at my previous company where the company culture just went downhill. But if I was going to go into an office every day, might as well go into an office with people I would choose to be around, not be around purely just for business reasons. Shay is evangelical about making sure his employees are happy, offering free food in the cafeteria, covering all medical benefits, and even supplying a life coach to help employees reach their goals. I just was accepted to the brand marketing internship. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> that is great. Congratulations. Fortune Magazine named Zappos one of the top 10 companies to work for. There's some rowdy folks, feel free to take pictures and video and we go around. And the business world is taking notice. Don't mind the silly straight folks, it's superhero week. Employees and other companies often show up at Zappos headquarters, taking tours and trying to understand what makes Zappos so successful, often with disbelief. I think they think we're nuts. I think people are generally afraid to allow employees to be themselves because then they feel like the power is taken away. It's really more than just a place to work. It's, it's a lifestyle. Most Apple's employees, when they leave the office, leave to hang out with other Apple's employees. Not because we force them to, but because they actually choose to. After a decade, Zappos dominated the online shoe industry, and it has expanded into other products. And last year, Amazon bought the company for $1.2 billion. But asked Shay to stay on as CEO. He agreed for a salary of just $36,000 a year. That's my way of making sure that I'm actually only there providing happiness. I'm not staying more than money. So any, any thoughts about this? People think we're nuts, is what he said. What do you, what do you think's going on here? Well, I mean, one of my impressions, Alex, is uh, if, when you're talking about that kind of money, it's really easy to be concerned about the luxury of staff culture and be throwing a lot of money into staff culture. The reality of it is, is a lot of the people in this room work in the human service industry, which not exactly a $1.2 billion business. Yeah. That, that's, that, that's one thing that I picked up on well, from that. But, but. start that way. Well, well, I don't know. It didn't start that way, number one. And number two, one of the things about, um, about DaVita, all these companies, DaVita specifically, we're going to talk about rewards a little bit later. They have one award a year for their 50,000 employees that they now have. That's called the Shining Star Award. And they get a $200,000 convertible. No, that's not true. They get a green jacket. That cost them fifteen dollars to make. That says "Shining Star" on it. Fifteen dollars to make. What goes the farthest? What makes the biggest impact is not how much money you spent, but it's the gesture, and it's realizing the process you go through to choose that person, and you make it public. And you only choose one person, and you give them something that's uniquely Davida, uniquely special. 
So it's the green jacket from the, from the masters that they, they try to play off of. And it's the same thing with Davida. You see everybody, they, they, all that stuff they have on and they're wearing, that's all stuff they junk they brought from home. And everybody's in cubicles, so they're not spending any money. And if, if you see him flying in a private jet, it's because he, he flies around and speaks a lot, but also because he's, he's a multimillionaire. Um, but the, 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 you don't need to spend hardly any money on culture. You don't need money for culture. Trust me, no money for culture. At Google, if you go to Google's campus, you're going to see that um, you can get free haircuts. Well, you know what? We at Kalo have somebody who comes to cut our students' hairs all the time. Do you know how much more it would cost us just to say, hey, staff, do you guys want to cut your hair? I mean, we're talking about 100 bucks a month. Do you know what impact that would make on them from a cultural perspective? We bring in masseuses, 15-minute masseuses for our frontline staff to come off and say, we value you, we respect you, we know it's a stressful job. That costs us 100 bucks a month. And one of our employees came almost crying. He says, I am never going to leave Kalo because I have never been in a company or heard of a company my whole life that brings in a masseuse. It didn't cost us anything. And if I send a handwritten note complimenting somebody for a, a job well done that has to be pointing out to our values and how it's aligned and reinforces them, that will make all the difference for years. Because praise is, and recognition is the most powerful uh, motivator for employees. You don't need money for culture. You don't need any money for culture. You can bring something from home and give it to an employee, and they will value that more than any, any money. And you can see that too when you, give, when you pay people more money, they're not more engaged. And you see, when you ask people to rank salary based on how engaged they are, or satisfied they are, it's never in the top five. Never. No matter what company you go to, it's never in the top five. It's not about money. So you can, all of you should be empowered to be able to create this. And I'll talk about what we do at Kalo for a little bit. But here's a couple things. A company with strong cultures tend to outperform those without strong cultures. I would say that's probably all the time if it's the right culture, if you're intentional about it. They have a core value about creating fun and a little weirdness. Employees need to have fun. If you go and interview at Zappos and you wear a suit, automatically they don't care what you say or what you do, you're not hired. And you need to laugh at least a handful of times and you need to say a joke. And you don't know about that, but it's the same thing at Southwest because it's about fun. So when you go on the Southwest airplane, they're always say saying silly things. So the culture part is important. Uh, he says, might as well choose people I would want to hang out with and not just do business with. And it's more than a place to work, it's a lifestyle. And then he has a salary of $36,000, and it's his way of making sure I'm not staying for the money. And that's where you can get the most engaged employees that aren't there, hands and feet, pay me my salary, clock out and go home. They're there for the mission, for the purpose. And they're there because they feel like they fit. Because what the values of this organization are my values. And I couldn't work anywhere else because I'm meant to be here. And, that's, and, that, and that, that is uh, very powerful. And one thing they do is called the offer. You come into Zappos, the first three weeks, 100% of your time is spent training and learning the business. And um, after that three week period, they your manager comes up to you with a $1,000 check written out to your name and says, if you quit right now, I'll give you $1,000. And the first three weeks, they spend a ton of time training on culture, on values, on the purpose, on why they exist. And they want you to take that money and leave. And if you don't, then you're the right person. So they're fanatical about making sure that the right people are there for the right reasons and it's not about the money. The people that, too, that most employees, 90% of the employees at Zappos are call center employees, and they also make $8, $10 an hour. They, Zappos doesn't pay any more from a, from a uh, salary perspective, wage perspective, than, than any other call center. So what is the purpose of culture? There's a couple things. One of them is... It's a source of meaning at work. It's a source of meaning at work, inspirational, a source of motivation. Why do you go to work? Is it for the paycheck? Or is this, this bigger dream, this bigger vision you're working toward? Um, it aligns the organization. You don't need a lot of policies and procedures and way to conduct yourself. If you have these unsaid social norms, that's going to be the power. Um, it's one of, the, one of the criteria for making decisions. I'm going to talk about the wash, wash plant a little bit later. Criteria for evaluating, for hiring people, for retaining people. A lot of times it's hard to figure it out. Usually what people do is they hire someone just like them. Or you hire whoever lets you talk more. Because if you're talking more, you feel good about yourself. And if you feel good about yourself, you think that person's awesome. And you end up hiring the person who's the best interviewer. 
That has nothing to do with if that's the best person for your job. Interviewing is terrible. The one thing that I, I could uh, I recommend to you guys is don't spend hardly any time on resumes or interviewing. Spend all of it on reference checks because that's where you're going to get the real information. You don't want to hire the best interviewer. That has nothing to do with it. It's the job you want to hire. The last thing is that it raises people's sight from just focusing on their own area and start thinking about teammates. Start thinking about this community first. At Kalo, we talk about the Kalo family. It's the family first, it's the company second. We have a now common goal that we're rallying behind. We collaborate because it's not about different departments. We're all the same. We're here for the same reasons. The culture is powerful. So it becomes about hearts and minds. Like I said, it's not hands and feet, but we're moving people's hearts and minds. So you're now you're asking, well, how do, how do they do that? And so Drew's point is, well, because they, they, they have a ton of money. And so I, I try to make the point that it has nothing to do with it. And I'm going to show you right now, how to, and this is where the presentation becomes practical, and I'm going to move very quick and show you how, how they do it. So this is the last goal of the presentation, which is to empower, to empower you to go and make a change at your organization. It doesn't matter where you are, the most powerful change opportunities come from below. The lower the change initiative starts from, the, the, more, the more staying power it has, the more powerful the change is going to be. So how do I do that? Four things. One is you want to come up with a core purpose. A core purpose is your fundamental reason for existing. The second thing is you want to come up with a vision. It's a vivid description of what your future looks like. The third thing are your values, your core values. And we'll talk about that in a second. The last thing is a core ideology, how you box it all to the, together and what's the framework you think about it. So a core purpose is the first step. It's your reason for being. Why, why do you exist? What's, what's the purpose? You cannot fulfill a purpose because it's your reason for being. If you get there and you accomplish it, then you have no reason for being. So your core purpose has to be very lofty. It's like a guiding star on the horizon, forever pursued but never reached. Um, and it's there to guide and inspire. So here's some examples real quick. is 3M, with inventors of, of <coughs> uh, Post-it notes and about 100,000 other products that you would have no idea, but the coolest things that you use in everyday life, they probably invented them. Um, and, but their core purpose is to, unsolve, to solve unsolved problems innovatively. Are they ever going to stop doing that? Are they going to reach that? No, there's always going to be problems. Pacific Theaters, which this is a movie company, right? Their core purpose is not to show movies to people. It's to provide a place for people to flourish and to enhance the community. So that's the guiding inspirational aspect. For Pizza Hut, it wasn't about selling pizza. It was about bringing families together because they knew that that's where people would share. So they would inspire by the idea that when we share, when we sell pizzas, oftentimes we hear that's the one dinner a night the family sits around the table together to eat. And that inspires people to work at Pizza Hut, not the passion, it has nothing to do with the pizza, nothing to do with the shoes. Walt Disney World is to make people happy consistently, not just kids, not just why they're at Walt Disney World, not just one day, not just for one hour, it's to make people happy. And lastly, Merck that makes drugs, it's not about making drugs, it's about preserving and improving human life. Core purposes are powerful. So how do you come up with these? Here's some exercises that you can bring to your company to come up with a core purpose. The random corporate serial killer. If I could come to your organization and kill it, how would that make you feel? And let's say you could get the same job somewhere else, but your organization is dead. And you could work in a different industry, but your organization is dead. Why would, how would that make you feel? And if it makes you feel like whatever, then there's a cultural problem. If it makes you feel really bad. Say me why, because what, what value do you add to society? Here's another way to think about it. In Kalo, we talked about how could we frame the purpose of Kalo so that if you woke up tomorrow morning with enough money in the bank to retire, you would still keep working here. What deeper sense of purpose would motivate you to continue to come into work? And lastly, it's this why, why, why. You want to get at the core. We deliver residential treatment and care to youth. Okay, I wanna, why? Why is that important? Oh, because kids are buttheads these days. Well, why? Why? And, and then you keep on going down. So one thing that we did, what's important is that, like I mentioned, the most powerful change will come from the bottom, is that the, and, and that also culture needs to be self-discovered, not imposed. So what we did is important is we got, we got uh, five different subgroups of 10 different employees in each subgroup, and we brainstorm different core purposes, different core values, to bring out the ones that really already existed. And you have post-it notes, and it needs a very active meeting. People put up the post-it notes, and they get these little stickies, these stars, and so you don't talk to anybody, and you put all your ideas, and you see everybody's opinions, and then you take your stars, and you have five of them, you can put the star on the ones that you like the most, and then we take off all the ones that don't have stars, and we keep, keep the other ones, and you get three more stars, and you put those on, eventually you're gonna find one 
and that's your core purpose. And you do that with multiple groups to avoid groupthink, and you're going to come up with your core purpose, and you do the same thing with core values. So Kalo's core purpose is to profoundly change lives and create joy. And that is uniquely Kalo because our treatment model is effective, not necessarily efficient. Level systems are effective, sorry, efficient. Moving quickly through the program. The relational aspect, you can't be efficient with relationships, they take time. But the good thing is, is that the change is gonna be profound. We're looking for profound change. We're not looking for behaviors. We don't want you to stop smoking pot. We don't want you to stop yelling or outbursts. Those are superficial in our opinion. We want profound change. And joy is very important. It's very different than happiness. Because joy is the product of a shared experience. Happiness is the product of a selfish human being. Happiness has to do with what do I get out of this? Do I get a laugh? Do I get to feel good? Joy is a product of a shared experience that only occurs when you put someone else first before you. And our ultimate goal at Kalo is for our students to learn how to live an interdependent life, the give and take of relationships. And the only way to have a deep, healthy relationship is if you put the other person first. It's about empathy. It's about attunement. Because if all you care about is how do I feel and what's going on with me and I'm not enjoying this project and I don't like this, can you find joy from seeing someone else enjoying that? So Kalo's core purpose is to profoundly change lives and create joy. And that's why everybody comes to work every day. Second step is vision. Um, and vision is three things. It's, it's, it's the core purpose, fundamental reason for being, core values, and the last thing are these big, hairy, audacious goals. A big, hairy, audacious goal, a B-hag, B-H-A-G, a B-hag, a big, big, hairy, audacious goal is different than a core purpose because these you want to reach, crazy goals that you want to reach. The only way um, that you can reach those goals, or let, let, me, let me step back with a B-hag. Um, uh, and so Kalo's purpose, Kalo's vision, our vision, Kalo's vision is to become to children's attachment what Saint, children's trauma, what St. Jude's is to children's cancer. Our vision is that Kalo will become to children's trauma what St. Jude's is to children's cancer. And we want to get to the place where the reputation is so well known and so powerful. And, and St. Jude's evokes so many emotions in all of you, I can imagine. And that's what the vision is about, is evoking that emotion. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be this, an emotional poll. We think it fits our organization. Nike, which is all about competition, in your interview, they're going to ask you about how competitive you are. Their initial goal was, when they started, was to crush Adidas. And, and Adidas has been around much longer than Nike was. Nike was started in the 70s. And did they, boy, did they ever crush them. Nike's, Nike's not even doing sports stuff anymore. Nike's got into surfing. I was watching the International Surfing uh, Contest the other day, and they, they're making surfboards because they did so well in terms of their vision and accomplishing it. And the only way to do that if you think about competition is think about this picture. What's that picture of? A leaf. A leaf. And what would you say about this picture? What, what impresses you about this picture? Detailed. Detailed. The word I'd like to use is it's vivid. It's not as good on this screen. If you look on my computer, even more so, but if you look on an LCD, the water, you can see the membranes of the leaf. You never see that from, so it's vivid. What you need is a vivid description of the future. That's gonna be your vision, a vivid description of the future where I can feel it, smell it, touch it, see it. And that's what athletes do all the time. Any swimmer, for example, or a soccer player, will envision them making a certain play and scoring a goal. And what happens so often with the top athletes in the world is they score the goal exactly how they dreamt it and it's scientifically been proven. Why don't we do the same thing in our organizations? In 10 years, this is what Kalo's gonna be and I will tell you and I'll describe it and you're gonna get goosebumps and you're gonna be like, wow, do I ever wanna be here for that? Not only do we have a core purpose that's inspirational, but now we have a reality of where we're going and we're gonna move towards that vision. And you remember where we have the guardrails? Now we know where we are now. We know who we are. We know where we're going. Now let's go there. And we know how to behave. You got all the pieces you need to see the success that Southwest has seen, to see the success that Davida has seen, Zappos has seen. 
The third step is core values, and this I would argue is the most important one, so pay attention to this one. We cannot set organizational values. We can only discover them, nor can we install new core values into people. Core values are not something people buy into. People must be predisposed to holding them. The task, therefore, is for us to find people who are already predisposed to sharing our core values. We must attract and then retain those people and let those who aren't predisposed to sharing our core values go elsewhere. You have to be obsessive and ruthless about this. Because or else the whole thing falls apart, eventually. Over the short term, you think everything's going great. The culture will tear you apart. And that's what the CEO of Zappos said. The last thing I want to do is go back to one of those companies. That's what happened to DaVita. It's the same exact business. Southwest Air, Air, it's the worst industry in the world. You know that in 2012 was the first year that Southwest did not win the Mer number one place for the American Customer Satisfaction Index? You know who did? JetBlue. Do you know who founded JetBlue? David Neeleman. Do you know where David Neeleman worked before JetBlue? Southwest. Do you know the one thing that David Neeleman says he stole from, Jeff, from Southwest? The culture. So um, with regards to choosing people, I think it's really important to think about your organization in this way. On the x-axis you have performance. Do your employees um, fulfill their commitments? Are they performing at a high level? Then on this category you want cultural fit. Do they, do they fit your culture? The, are they living up to your values? And we have some slam dunks here, easy calls. The first one is high cultural fit, fit with the values and, and performing well. That's your star. What do you do with your stars? You nurture them, you keep them, because they're going to be examples for everybody else. Another easy call, what if there's no cultural fit, they don't live up to your values and they're poor performers? Easy call, get rid of them right away. Don't waste time on them because they suck so much of your energy and you're going to realize as a manager you spend more time on these people than you do with these people. And that again, is going to ruin your culture because who's going to leave? Not the person you want to leave, the star. They're going to be fed up. It's not why they're there. One that's a little bit more complicated is the one in the upper right-hand corner. You need to give them second chances. You need to coach them because the most important thing is cultural fit. But you can't have somebody who's just not performing and, and, is, and is a really nice person and fits your culture. Eventually, you have to perform. Give them coaching. Give them a second chance. Work with them. Spend your time out with them. Invest in them. The most important one is this bottom one, though. And this is where everybody goes wrong. Because they think it's about performance. And this is where the poison is in your organization. The poison lies in where you have the all-stars, the performers, the people that are bringing in all the business, the people that are, have the best clinical outcomes in terms of therapists, the best staff, but, the, but they think they're all that. They think they're the best person. No, they don't care about the team because they know how good they are. They don't fit your culture. This is where everybody goes wrong, and this is where nobody can figure it out. You need to go with them right when you know that. Sit down. You either change right now. This is so serious. You either change right now or you leave. That's, that's the end of it. And you have to have, especially as a leader and manager, the gumption to make that decision, to make that call. And if you can't do that, you won't have the culture, the powerful culture that others have. So here's the exercise to come up with your core values. Same thing. You need to empower your frontline staff, empower all your employees, because remember, core values are not installed, they already exist. Especially if you're a startup, maybe it's different. Two people who are starting a company, define your culture at the front end, start hiring those people. You guys already hired people, so you have a culture. Unfortunately, if you have a bad culture, you're gonna have to clean house. And I think that you have to make that investment early on. So exercise. Um, what core values do you personally bring to work? So what are your core, what do you hold most dearly? You need to ask your employees that. And these core values should be so fundamental that you would hold them regardless of whether or not they were rewarded, they were rewarded, or if they became a competitive disadvantage. Walt Disney World, hey, if, if, if people say that being happy is dumb, or like I'm saying, you know, it's, there's a selfishness aspect to it, and people stop, stop going, they don't care. Because because they're, they're all about making people happy. So you have to make sure that that is so core, so core, that you won't change it for anything. What would you tell your children are the core values that you hold at work and that you hope they will hold when they become working adults? So what makes you proud? What about who you are makes you proud? And can you envision them being as valid for 100 years? Because the core values cannot change. You define them and you reinforce them. You talk about them all the time. And lastly, if you were to start a new organization tomorrow in a different line of work, different line of work, totally different. And this is important with Tony Shea is that he's, I could sell anything. It's not about the shoes. So his culture is defined. He knows, is, oh, I want to put a little weirdness into, into this company. And that's going to make the difference, and that's gonna, we're going to have great customer service. 
So Kalo's core values, four of them. Number one, trusting relationships. Relationships are what, the make, what makes the world go around. And it's what we want our students to understand. The only way for them to understand relationships if, is if we model healthy relationships. The only way for us to model healthy relationships is if we model healthy relationships at home. Healthy relationships starts with a deep connection, oftentimes, almost always goes on to some sort of break. And the most important part is the repair. Too often in work, we say it's just business, and why am I gonna repair? I'm just gonna work around this person. At Kalo, we require you to repair. You need to work on the relationships. Those relationships have to exist. And it's based on a foundation of trust. The next one we have is empathy. And I've talked about empathy before. It's very powerful, especially in what we do, because at the end of the day, we want our students to have empathy. So again, we need to model that behavior. It's to seek to understand before seeking to be understood. It's about putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So it's not about the frontline staff and the therapists and the therapists and the academics and the teachers. We're all on the same board, on, on the same on the same page. And that's what the culture creates. And then you have to have the empathy for the struggles that many are going through. The next one is growth. We have this mo motto at Kalo that's just grow or die. And it's not just the growth of the organization, it's interpersonal growth. It's, it's, it's professional growth. You always need to be learning. There's a concept of growth mindsets and fixed mindsets. Fixed mindset says, oh, that's just how I am. You know, deal with it. You know, as as that's, I've always been like that. My mom told me that when I was young. A growth mindset says, thank you for that feedback. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. Give me more. I want to improve. I want to be able to be influential. I want to make an impact. Growth mindset. And we can figure this out right away. And what happens to people that have fixed mindsets and not, f mindsets that aren't performing? They're gone. At Kalo, they don't exist. You have to be ruthless with those decisions. Because or else, there's dissonance. And service is an important one. Um, at the end of the day, you need a servant heart to work in our industry. And you need grace and you need compassion. And that, that service needs to go on to serving others. We believe in serving our community. We believe in serving our students. We're not there to tell them what to do. We're there to serve them. We believe in serving our parents. We believe in serving our referring professionals. So we only hire people with a servant heart. So you can imagine our interviews when we try to get at this. Tell me about a deep relationship, hurt that you've had in your past. I want to know, if you're comfortable, what happened? Was there a big break? And, and tell me about if there was a repair. I'm interested in hearing about that. And sometimes somebody would talk about this, this very superficial break. Um, and other people would talk about a repair that is also very superficial. We know right away what to do with that person, not to hire them. So it doesn't matter what your resume says. You ask questions about your culture. The fourth step is to structure your core ideology. And this is hard to see, but in the middle, Kalo, is your core purpose. Profoundly change lives, create joy. And around it, you have your core values of growth, service, empathy, and trusting relationships. And, and this dictates our business and professional mindset and how we behave and relate to each other. And so we call it the Kalo way. What is the Kalo way? We talk about financial discipline. If there's no margin, there's no mission. We talk about that money follows, it doesn't lead. If you make decisions based on money, it's going to catch up with you. And money follows quality. So you will continue to be successful if you focus on quality. We talk about great people. We have to hire great people, but you also need great process. Because in order to make good decisions, you have to go through the right steps first. We talk about shared responsibility. We're all responsible for what happens here. But we also talk about individual accountability. Continuous improvement. We want to know the root cause analysis. When there's a fire, just go, don't turn it off. Put it out. Because we have a lot of great people that can put out fires. At the end of the day, what happened? And whatever happened, let's fix that so it doesn't happen again. Show me the data. Nicole knows frequently we, we, we'll say something and a, a lot of uh, you know, people are, are expressive and will have a strong opinion about something and say it. And somebody else is like, where's the data? You know, well, if there's no data, then, then the, the opinion doesn't, really can't stand on much. And that's a lot what, what Davida did as well. Servant leadership is, is important. There's a triangle concept that the hierarchical corporations, the leader, the CEOs at the top, and others exist to serve him or her and their vision. Our triangle is upside down, where the leader exists to serve everybody else. Because we believe that every employee we have is inherently motivated to do a good job. And if they don't, it's because you got in the way. Nobody goes and starts a job to say, I want to be a crappy employee. We ruin it for them. Our culture ruins it for them. Our micromanaging, our leadership style. And we have other concepts that, are, that, are, that I'll skip because we're running out of time. So once you create it, how do you manage it? 
And this is how it's managed. First of all, leadership, very important, needs to be visible. The language, the language. I need to talk, I need to be talking about this language all the time. In my emails, when I praise employees, use my language. In every email, I want to throw in a core value just in part of the sentence, so it becomes part of our, our, our core language. Actions, what do I do? My actions speak louder than my words. Everybody on our leadership team. And we all need to be consistent. Consistency is so important for our students. It's so important for culture. They're, you can't create dissonance. Selective hiring, hire for fit, ask the right questions. You want to involve the team. Whole Foods does an interesting thing, and we do this too. Our interview process is 90 days because you come and you get to work and you work for 90 days and we evaluate and 90 days later we go back and we take a real hard look at you and we put you through this wash plan of do they live up to our core values and if you don't, you're gone. And who gets to decide that? The team. Who you work with. Do you fit or not? Because we already have the cult and people and the culture and who's there and so they know who fits and right away it feels awkward. So the thing with Davida, if all you guys kind of feel Ooh, well, wow, that's kind of off. That's weird. Good. You shouldn't work there. They don't want you to work there. If you're kind of a blah right through the middle company, you're going to get all sorts of people you don't want. If you're extreme and you're, you're really innovative and you're different, you're out of the box, then that box is only there for certain people. Uh, rewards are very important, like I mentioned. And, and they need to be based on values. And not monetary values, they need to be based on core values. And that's what this, this green jacket that DeVita would give. And you need company-wide recognition. Information sharing, performance metrics, you need, to, you need to evaluate employees based on these culture and your core values. You need to have the symbols like Davida did with the stars. We have a concept of a red wall. Our staff oftentimes wear red shirts. Red wall for, me, for us really means teamwork. And so we talk about, man, do you see the red wall? Because a lot of times if there's an issue and there's a scuffle with a student, all of a sudden you see something going on there and you kind of turn around and look back, there's a red wall. All the staff were over there supporting each other. So what are we, what are we gonna do? We're gonna paint a wall in the coach's office red and we're going to start to give awards to frontline staff who voted, as voted by their peer for the Red Wall Award. And they get their picture up on the Red Wall. So you walk in there and you have peer pressure. You see, and you, man, my picture's not up there. I've been here for a year. You're going to leave. And that's the peer pressure. And that's what we want. It makes it easier for us, for you to feel, feel uncomfortable. And the training part is important. When you onboard something, you train them about the culture immediately. And the, the best thing that Zappos can do is they, they brainwash you into it right away and they give you a thousand bucks. So you're either bought in or you're not. And like I mentioned before, we, you can't buy into it. You're either predisposed or you're not. So you, it, it's either, I, I, I mean, give me $5,000, I'm not leaving. Because this isn't a job, this is a lifestyle. This is a calling for me. And people work at Zappos, Zappos who feel like it's a calling. If anywhere it should be a calling, it should be in our industry. United Health Services, huge multinational. Why aren't they the best place to work at? They're changing people's lives. They're saving people's lives. Because there's no, there's no culture. Um, so lead by example is important. No matter where you are in the organization, lead by example. Remember, that's company, community, team first, company second. You want to honor those that live up to your, to your core values. You want to make people self-conscious when they don't. And you want to adhere to those values in all decisions that you make. We think about it from a wash plan. If any of you have seen the Gold Rush TV shows, and so you put the, all the rocks and the dirt in there, and then at the end of the day, you get gold. And so at Kayla, we talk about our cultural wash plan. Whenever we have a decision, we say, let's put it through the wash plan. So what, what would our culture say? Well, are we being empathetic? Are we seeking to understand? Are we caring about the relationship? Or are we putting people in a box? Do we have that heart of peace? Or are we putting people in the box? And are we thinking from a servant leadership perspective of serving them? How are we getting in the way? And is, or is it helping us grow? It becomes really easy to make decisions. And it becomes very consistent. And so then where does, where does management go? It goes out the window. You don't need to manage anybody. People know what you're supposed to do. You know what's right and what's wrong because it's staring right at, right at you, right in your face, 24-7. So, some important things. It needs to be pervasive. I'm almost done here. It needs to be pervasive everywhere. You need it on the walls. You need it in your, in your marketing materials. You need it in your onboarding. You need people to talk about it. You need symbols. You need dry. Everybody needs to, it needs to be. And what does that mean? It takes time. So, whenever I get up to, to speak in front of, of, of my company, an all-company meeting, there isn't once that I don't get up and I can ask, what do you think I'm going to talk about today? Culture. Every day, whenever I speak to them, it has to be about culture, and you have to spend the time on that. It takes time. So I have three goals for today. One is to share three different case studies. The Southwest, if you remember, Ken Blanchard, leading with love. 
Um, and um, the next one was DeVita Dialysis Company with Kent Theory, who turned the whole company around because of culture. Southwest, in the wor one of the worst industries to do business in the world, one of the best performing companies in the history of the world, in one of the worst industries. Extremely powerful culture. Zappos, um, eventually Amazon, bought them because they couldn't compete. And Amazon's a behemoth. And they realized that Zappos pretty soon, soon is going to start sh selling all, all sorts of other stuff. And we, we have so many people and we can't figure out the culture. What did they buy Zappos for? Their technology? No, oh, they bought their culture. Um, next thing is to persuade. So hopefully I have persuaded you that it's important to focus on culture. That's going to make all the difference. It's, it's going to make you a more engaged employee. Financially, your organization is going to perform better. You're going to have employees like yourself and others that are going to be more engaged. And lastly, you're going to have your customers, your families, referring professionals, and students that are more satisfied. And then I wanted to empower you um, by talking about the important things that you have to do. You have to come up with a core purpose. I talked about some exercises and process to go through that. The vision needs to be a vivid description. Core purpose is the fundamental reason for existence. The vision is about the big, hairy, audacious goal that you can reach in 10 years. And it's also about this vivid description of the future. Take me there. I want to feel it. Have pictures and talk about numbers and who's doing what and who's where. And the core values, which is the most important thing. Core ideology, which frames all of it together. Um, so before I wrap up, we, uh, we actually have a club at Kalo called the Culture Club. And we have a representative from every single department. And they're not leadership. And they came up with the name. And they're going to present to the company in, within the next couple weeks. And one of them is going to dress up as Boy George and put the music on. And, and they're going to talk about what the culture club is all about. Some of them were a little younger. <laughs> Some were a little younger, so they didn't know. Um, and so I, I, I want to pass something out for you guys to read. It's going to take, it's going to take two minutes, but I, my hope is that this, this tells a story. So if the presentation didn't persuade you, that this, this uh, letter will pers persuade you. It's called Pots and Pans. And it's from one of our employees. Um, I have some pictures here of our Christmas party. Here's a few members of our leadership team with our leadership team picture, Christmas picture, uh, headstand co contest. And we gave a number of Christmas gifts to, to various employees. And one of our employees got some pots and pans. And this was her letter back to us, our, our leadership team, about the pots and pans that she got. She broke down crying when, at, in the middle of the party when she received the pots and pans. power of culture. Thank you.